The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. But if you, get, if you order the ancient blueprint, look for it on our website. Get the free copy of Was Jesus a Capitalist? And if you already have it, give it to a friend. Because I'll tell you, with an election coming up, I think we need to be educated. Uh, and educated beyond listening to the news. You don't want to be educated listening to the news. All right? You want to be educated in the Word of God and what God is speaking. Right? Okay. Now. Here's that, here's that senior moment again of repetition. Our ministry, Kingdom Life Church, your gifting is to make ready a people prepared for the time of a billion soul harvest. You cannot rely on the system of the church as is. I mean, there are still churches, pretty antiquated, but there are still churches that expect the pastor to do everything. Like... Bless God, our pastor made 485 house calls this year. You know, no, that's, that's not ministry. You're going to be surprised, but the day is going to come when all the prophetic voices come to pass. You know, all the prophetic voices that I listen to are basically telling me what's going to happen. That is not our ministry. Our ministry is, what do you do when that happens? I'm not hearing a lot of that. And I'm telling you what you need to do when that happens. You, you need to be able to teach other people this. You need to be able to disciple them with two things. The how-tos, how to do what they already know the Bible says for, the, for the, uh, uh, the more seasoned Christian. But for the brand new Christian, teaching them the basic of what's right and what's wrong. What kind of a foundation that they can have. And how to have ears to hear what the Spirit is saying. And the day is going to come when you know the Scripture but it's not been applied in the church. It's a weak area. It says, go ye into all the world and make Talmudim. That's make disciples, immersing them. Not one time, immersing them in the nature of the Father, in the nature of the Son, and in the nature of the Holy Spirit. Immersing them is to disciple them. You individually, if you're a believer, were called to disciple. That's not just fivefold ministers. Uh-uh. You were called to make disciples. And that's not just leading somebody to the Lord. Making disciples means you're going to have to reproduce according to your kind. But then that brings up a question, what kind are you? All right? Isn't that the reason God created man initially in, in Genesis 1? He created you for fellowship, to be created in the image of God, to function, to function as intended, and to reproduce. Reproduce how? According to kind. Well, you can only give somebody what you've got yourself. So in this church, anyway, I'm believing that we're going to be like a, the tribe of Issachar, you know? How many know what Issachar was known for out of all the tribes? They knew what Israel ought to do. And I'm saying that's always been, when I look back in hindsight, I paid attention to what all the prophetic voices were saying and the consensus of, of the prophetic voices that, that were accurate. And I looked to see what was God telling Dennis at the time of the prophetic voices. And in some cases, I paid a price for it because it was pretty much right on the edge of uh, conflict. You know, sometimes a, a new move of God, the worst enemy is the previous move. That does happen, you know. Uh, um, and when I look back on it, I'm saying everything God ever told me to do, I could see was to make ready a people prepared in light of what the prophetic voices were saying. So I want to see a solution-oriented people, not just the prophetic people that can tell me what's going to happen. I want to see a solution-oriented people that say, I know what to do. And you know what's going to happen? If there's a billion soul harvest, every one of you is going to be required by the Spirit of God to help somebody, disciple somebody. And that's going to be, in the past, you may have become more of an audience, but that's going to cease. You're going to, whether it's your own grandchildren, your children, the neighbors, 
you're going to have a responsibility to help somebody along. I, I, I'm, I'm so grateful, uh, even my next door neighbor, uh, 20 years ago, we led him to the Lord, a young Jewish man, and he said he was trained to stay, you could do just about anything, learn anything, but stay away from Jesus. He said that only made him curious, and then when he found out that I was a pastor living next door, it only got his curiosity about this Jesus. And he used to say, and the hammer of Thor was pounding on my chest while you would talk. <laughs> and it was, he was under conviction. But he's a believer, and he even wrote, uh, he, he wrote in the, uh, uh, the front of the book uh, what he received out of this book as a Jewish believer. And what's beautiful, do you know what he did with his children? He knew his children were going to secular school and everything. When they came home, he taught them apologetics. He taught them how how to, under, how to think for yourself and how to put two and two together and understand that there are voices. You know, the scripture says there's a voice that comes from the city, there's a voice from the temple, and then there's the voice of God, and sometimes the voice of God doesn't match the voice coming from the temple. Okay? So you've got to have ears to hear what the Spirit is saying. So there. Um, and again, if you're watching by YouTube or... Uh, Facebook Live, I uh, want to really encourage you to order the, an ancient blueprint for the supernatural and get the free copy of Was Jesus a Capitalist and give it to somebody after you read it. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Amen. All right. Um, we've, we've done uh, two messages on practicing the presence of God. Again, over the years, to make ready a people prepared, uh, we would see comments come from around the world that would say the same thing. Here's somebody telling us how to do what we already knew biblically we're supposed to do. And so I want to cover that today. You know what I want to cover today? Because we're good at quoting the right answers, but then I want you to go and hear guest speakers when you go get back to conferences and all that kind of thing. And you get back there, I want you to ask the guest speaker, every time they say something profound, I want you to ask them, how do you do that? Because it's a missing ingredient in the church. How do you do that? Well, just believe. Well, I want more than that. I want to know how. And everything that we're teaching, a lot of it came out of Jennifer. When we first got married, she said, disciple me. And one of the first things I had to teach her was, how to bring thoughts captive to the obedience of Christ. Now, everyone in here knows you're supposed to. Bring your thoughts captive. But how many would be able to tell someone else, how do you do that? Well, we're going to cover that today. And you're going to know how. But then you're going to be responsible to help someone else, who's, especially if they're troubled in their thought life. You need to have some of the how-tos to help someone else other than yourself. But start with yourself. Because if you own it, you can give it to other people. Okay? Now, <clears throat> here we go. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5. It talks about bringing every thought captive to the obedience of Jesus. Okay, first of all, we've got to start clarify right off the bat. Where's Jesus? Point to him. That's better. Uh, I don't want, I, okay. Bringing every thought captive to the obedience is an internal work of the Spirit as a believer. It's how do I take runaway thoughts and bring them captive? Bringing every thought captive to the obedience of Messiah. How do I do that? Well, you know, I, I like Ephesians 4 8 as well, where Jesus took captivity captive I know you've read this and when he took captivity captive he gave gifts unto men I like that you know what it did when Jesus takes captivity captive he turns the table on the enemy and he gave gifts unto men he said these people that have been held captive by the enemy, I have freed them and liberated them, and then I'm given as gifts to men, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. For the, those are people gifts for the equipping of the saints. That means they should be equipping the saints 
for the saints to do the work of the ministry. Uh-oh. No, I thought they would do the work of the ministry. No, they would equip the saints for them to do the work of the ministry. And God basically intended that even the things that are happening to you for harm, God can turn it for good. And let me explain something. When you properly learn how to deal with thoughts, emotions, and choices, the weapons of your warfare, they're not carnal. They're mighty through God for the pulling down of strongholds. That's arguments, imaginations, thoughts, and high things that are what? Exalting themselves above a knowledge of the word. They're, they're, they're trying to win the argument through coercion, through brainwashing, we can call it whatever you want, but it's deception, and it's exalting itself over the Word of God. So how do we bring those kinds of thoughts captive? And um, one of the things that we've seen over the years in ministry, for the 44 years in ministry, I've seen this over and over and over again, and that is where people were attacked the most, where you've been most viciously, viciously attacked, Temptations that come your way are tailor-made for you. What? Mm -hmm. Temptation is tailor-made for you, however, on the other side of a proper response. That can be your greatest anointing. That can be your strength, because when you're weak and then you rely on Him, He Himself becomes your strength. So think about, where have you been beat up the most? Is there a particular area because that area can be your greatest strength when uh, when God showed me that I was under tremendous pressure from my family the only Christian taking a lot of abuse from for being a Christian and it seemed like how do I get shake free of this how do I deal with this I can forgive I know how to forgive I release but God basically said you take care of my children, you take care of my family, I'll take care of your family. And believe it or not, it was in relinquishing, instead of trying harder, in relinquishing my family and taking care of God's people and saying, I'm going to put forth all my effort into taking care of the family of God. All of a sudden, one by one, my father calls, are you sending people to talk to me about Jesus? <laughs> The Xerox salesman's here, and he's trying to tell me about Jesus. Did you send him? I, go, I don't even know a Xerox salesman. I, don't, I didn't do it. My father, my mother, she smoked uh, three packs of cigarettes a day from the time she was 15. And I got gloriously delivered uh, of nicotine. I walked over to the house, and she wasn't saved, but she, she knew that something happened to her son. Uh, smiley, and they, they meant smiley in a derogatory way, because I never did. Uh, smiley suddenly is smiling. And I walked in the house and took the cigarette out of her mouth. I don't suggest this is the way you do it, but, you know, a few months old, the Lord, what do you know? But I took the cigarette out of her mouth. She was instantly delivered, never had another cigarette. She came to Jesus real quick. And eventually, um, my sister, both sisters got saved. My one sister... Uh, had uh, MS when she was 19, and she would hide from me. So she was in the hospital a lot her teenage years with the MS, back problems, back flare-ups, eye flare-ups. And I would go to the hospital to tell her about Jesus, and she'd, she'd pretend like she was sleeping. She did everything she could. And then one time she had some kind of a tumor, uh, and the surgeons wanted to go in and get it, and I prayed for it, it disappeared. And even the surgeons were upset because there should have been, even if the, the tumor broke up, there should have been residue, and there wasn't any. And they were frustrated. And she came to Jesus, and better than that, after a short period of time in my church, although she, she would call my mother and say, Dennis is only preaching to me. He's picking on me. Every time he preaches, it's just for me until she, finally she went to somebody else's church and that guy did the same thing. And then she feel like, man, I think maybe that's God telling me these things and not my brother. But anyway, to make a long story short there, she ran from me most of her early years when I was a Christian 
But when she eventually gets married, guess who she marries? My best pupil. <laughs> and so all those years she ran from me, guess what she, she's hearing to this day? And if she's watching, she knows she's hearing. Your brother used to say, your brother used to say, your brother used to say. So here, many years later, she's still listening to my best pupil. This is what your brother used to say. See, you can run, but you can't hide. Because not if it's God. He's going to find you, and he's going to and do a number on you. His goodness. All right? Now, we know that uh, it's a great opportunity that if you handle an area that's being attacked to you, that can also be your strong, on the other side of that wounding, if it's properly brought to the cross, that can also be your strongest anointing. So look at it that way, and, and basically don't get defeated by one particular area, all right? Now, now we're going to do it, okay? And here, <coughs> this is the, um, the scripture that if you take our modules or you go on any of the online training, you're going to hear this scripture over and over again because it lays out a framework for how it works. This is not a formula. This is what Jennifer documented in me discipling her how to deal with her thought life, how to go from the initial encounter, encounter, that's relationship, from the initial encounter with Jesus to the subsequent process of relationship. That's not method. That's not a system. Although people will call it a method, people will call it a system, a formula. But in reality, it's relationship from its inception to the process of maturation. In other words, you are expected to start somewhere and to grow. Right? So Jennifer documented it, but here's a scripture that we used and then later used it in all of our modules out of the message translation. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 to 6. Now before I get into the message, most of you know this scripture from King James, New King James. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds arguments, imaginations, high things, proud things, that exalts itself against the knowledge of the Word, a knowledge of God Himself, the living Word. So, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, so you can't do this in the flesh. There is a spiritual encounter and relationship for you to cooperate with, that's right, cooperate with, because that's God who is at work in you, both to will and to perform. All right? But I want you to listen to this, because it's kind of, it's, I, I find it amusing. But the message translation starts out with verse 3. The world is unprincipled. It's dog-eat-dog -dog out there. <laughs> the world doesn't fight fair. But we don't live or fight our battles that way. Never have, never will. Now here it is. The tools of our trade aren't for marketing or manipulation, but they are for demolishing entire massively corrupt culture. That's my heart. That's my passion. That's our goal. Everything that we teach is to confront this massively corrupt culture. And that's really what the Didache and, and our latest book depicts. It was how to take these Gentiles who had no Old Testament, they had no Ten Commandments, they had no understanding. How did these apostles teach them to m attach this massively huge cultural brainwashing? And that's what they were, they're brainwashed. They look around, well, everybody believes it, so it's got to be right. Right? And all of a sudden now they're introduced to Jesus as their Messiah and they have no background. So now there's a culture clash. There's a major clash of cultures. And guess what's going to have to change? Your thinking. The thinking has to be at least given enough before there can be a transformation in believing. 
You've got to know right from wrong. And then you have the choice to, to sink into and believe into it until you absorb it and you are transformed by your, by, in your spirit man and renewed in that thought life. It says, these tools of our trade aren't for marketing or manipulation, but they're for demolishing the entire massively corrupt culture. We use our powerful God tools for smashing warped the, the, uh, philosophies, tearing down barriers that have been erected against the truth of God. And here's the part that, we've, that we take as automatic in Kingdom Life Church, but most of the church does not take this as automatic. Most, most people in the church do not have a healthy sense of their spiritual physiology, how it all works together. But you are a spirit, soul, and a body. And the way those work together, I think every Christian should have that known by the first six months that they're saved. You need to know that your thoughts are here, your will is here, your seat of your emotions is here, your conscience is here, the door of the heart is here. If you don't understand even that basic location, 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 that basic real estate, spiritual real estate, you're going to struggle with certain things. But God's basically saying, here are what those weapons of your warfare, or as the message calls them, God tools. It says, these God tools are there to tear down barriers, but it's going to do three things. And if you know spirit, soul, and body, and understand this whole mind, will, and emotions, you see what it was meant to do. It says, these God tools are to take every loose thought, emotion, and impulse into a structured life shaped by Jesus. Now, that can be automatic for some of us, but that's not automatic for a lot of people. They, they get so confused between feelings and thoughts and choices and impulses. But God's saying, I want all three of those, and I want to put them together. I want to, you know, even when the, he is the word of God. And what does the word of God say in Hebrews 4.12? The word of God separates soul from spirit, joints from marrow. So he will separate it out and say, this is good, this is evil. This is flesh, this is spirit. Once he separates it out, though, he's not trying to annihilate it. He wants your mind, your will, and your emotions to be put back together and function under the lordship of Jesus. Let the peace of God rule your thoughts, your emotions, and your choices. Don't make a choice without being preceded by the peace of God. We have a whole peace challenge just on that. And we've got... Actually, we've got a book on every one of these three parts, all right? But, uh, and I, we get comments on YouTube saying, oh, teach us about location, teach us. Get any one of our books, and it, it breaks it down so that you could teach someone else. But what God's basically saying here is that I want to take every thought, and it calls it in the message, loose thought. You know what a loose thought is? Those, those runaway thoughts that you have where you go, oh, you're weird, oh, you're weird, oh, you're no good, you're no it's Stuff that's contrary to Scripture, but you hear it in your head. Right? Do, does anybody else ever hear stupid things in their head? And you know they're not scriptural. Well, then you better learn how to bring it captive to the obedience of Jesus because he's the only one that can do anything with it. You try to argue with an argument, you will lose every time. Argue with an argument, you will lose. You can't fight flesh with flesh because the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. So it's got to be one in the spirit. Now, fitting every loose thought, runaway thought, every emotion. Now, I know most of the church has been taught for decades, I can't live by your feelings. And you can't live by your carnal feelings. But when you have carnal feelings, it tells you, it's just like Big Bird comes in with a sign. Remember Big Bird, Sesame Street? All right. No, you're all, you're all too young for that. Uh, <laughs> it's like Big Bird comes in and goes, Jesus isn't ruling. That's what you need. If you want a you wanna how-to, you need when you hear or feel fear. 
It's just like Jesus needs to come in with a sign going, I'm not ruling right now. Fear is anger, hurt. We used to call them hell flags. Hurt, that's the first letter of H flags. Hurt, fear, lust, anger, guilt, shame. If you experience any of those, Jesus isn't ruling at that moment. And if you stay there long enough, sin will abound. You give place to the devil. So you can give place two ways, in your thoughts and in your emotions. Two doors. And you know what he wants? He wants your will. The devil wants your will, and God wants your will. Where's your will? Right here. It's the door of the heart. But he doesn't go directly to your will with an impulse. He goes to the mind door to get to your will or your emotional door to get to your will. The devil's working from the outside trying to get in. God's already on the inside trying to work out. For it is God who is at work in you both to will and to do. Now, listen to this in the message translation. What God's trying to do is take every loose thought, toxic emotion, and impulse that's not being led by God. It's an impulse means there's a motor behind it and it's not God. All right? You might be excited to do it, but it's willpower is coming from a toxic emotion of, I got to have, I got to have, I want it, I want it now. All right? The only legitimate motivation is the love of God. And when love motivates, you're walking and practicing the presence of God. Peace is ruling. Love is ruling. Peace is God or love ruling. Let the peace of God rule. A step out of peace is a step into flesh. Now, it says that God's trying to take these loose thoughts, emotions, and impulses and shape them into a structure of a life that's being shaped by Jesus. Our tools, now this is for all those people that have to run to somebody else all the time. Our tools are ready and at hand for clearing the ground of every obstruction so that we can build lives of obedience into a place of maturity. So these tools are ready and at hand. That means they're available. And that doesn't mean you have to call somebody, oh my God, I had a bad thought. Yikes. You can learn how to, when nobody's around, take that thought captive to the obedience of Christ. That's my introduction. Let's see if we can get down to the nitty gritty. All right. First of all, you know, as soon as you're born again and you receive forgiveness, the minute you're born again and you receive forgiveness, there's a whole lot of things that are washed out. Right? I don't know about you, but I started thinking different instantly at conversion. I had happy thoughts that I don't know where they came from, but they had to be God because I never thought like that before. Kind thoughts. Loving thoughts. All right? But there was also some Dennis the Menace that was still there. And he'd resurrect every time. And Dennis the Menace liked to be in charge. And Jesus was trying to get him to submit. The first prophetic word I ever had was someone laying hands on me and laughing. And they said, Oh, Jesus loves your spirit, but you're really going to have to learn that he's not working that way. And I'm going, what way? She goes, oh, you grab Jesus by the hand and tell him what to do next. And you're running all over the country telling Jesus what to do. It's going to be a little different. It's going to be, no, follow him. <laughs> oh, all right. So you, so you need to transform some of these impulses to make sure the motive, even though you thought you're your heart was pure, God says, I'm going to show you how to purify it better so that it's not just energy or dead works. So first thing is that God wants to bring and conquer thoughts and bring them captive to the obedience of Messiah, 2 Corinthians 10.5. We're going to vanquish the negative emotion by applying uh, forgiveness 
and our will submits to Jesus within. So the way I taught Jennifer to do that when she would get a thought is I would say, there's two things you have to learn about thoughts. There, are, there is a line of communication, like the content, like, oh, you're dumb. <laughs> but next to that line of, oh, you're dumb, is a line of authority, meaning every communication that goes into your head has authority behind it, and it's either going to be good or evil. It's either going to be kind of relatively powerless or very powerful. So in order to bring a thought captive to the obedience of Jesus, you're going to have to first deal with the motor or the emotion behind the thought. Now, if I heard, you know, I never cared to golf. I went golfing with some pastors, and they told me to stay home because I talked through the whole time, and they were trying to concentrate. So I, I can't really get into this golfing, walking after this ball forever. Nobody's talking, shh, whisper, whisper. That's not for me. And watching it on television would be a good way to go to sleep for me. To put a golfing program, and they even whisper when they're talking, they're narrating. So anyway, um, if I heard in my head, Dennis, you're a lousy golfer. That's not scriptural. I'm not going to own it and take it to heart. But on the other hand, the power behind it was minimal. But if all of a sudden I heard a voice, Dennis, you're a lousy husband to Jennifer. And it, re it felt creepy. That has more power behind it. I'm going to say, that's not scriptural, and for one thing, I receive forgiveness for even tolerating the, the, the uh, aggressive anger that was behind it. You know, the voice of God, even a corrective word that comes from God, if you want to learn the voice of God, it's always got love attached. He's a loving Father, and if He corrects you, He's going to give you a word that has love attached to its nature. Remember, every corresponding word that you hear in your head has a line of authority. And what we've taught in the church is to just go by content. You can't just go by content. Is it scriptural or not scriptural? The devil can quote scripture. I want to know the nature that's attached or the authority that it has. Because if you tolerate an authority other than God, it's going to, you're going to believe it. You're going to own it. It's going to shape and mold you. And God wants a life shaped and molded, mind, will, and emotions in Jesus. So I say, Dennis, you're a bad husband to Jennifer. And it's intrusive, which that's not the way God speaks anyway. And so I would say, I receive forgiveness for even having allowed that. And what happens when you do forgiveness from the heart? What happens? Come on. Peace. Peace. Most of the church would, don't know that answer. They go, forgive and live with the pain. That is not scriptural. Forgiveness is an encounter and a subsequent relationship. Forgiveness and repentance brings you into a place of encounter and supernatural transaction. A supernatural transaction that does not result in the fruit of the Spirit is not a transaction. So when you forgive from the heart, it changes to peace. As a matter of fact, if you're ever going to pray for somebody, I know Jennifer does it because I can feel the presence of God when we pray together, when she's interceding for people. After you forgive, what happens? You removed anything toxic, any barrier between you and whatever. What's flowing out of you is love. Out of my belly flows a river. Because there's no barrier now. You can feel that anointing coming from people when they pray. Because it's not just what they say, it's what's attached, what authority is attached to what they say. And the easiest way to explain this, have you ever been complimented by someone and it didn't feel real? <laughs> There's a good example. Oh, I, I just love your hair the way you have it now. 
And if it felt creepy, it just might be it wasn't sincere. It just might be your discerner is picking up, I know what you said, but my spirit didn't really feel edified when you said it. So your spirit bears witness. Bear witness means it touches. I know we don't talk about feelings, but the church is going to have to get back to some realization that there are physical feelings. You stub your toe, you go, ouch, that's a feeling, physical. There's emotional feelings, hurt, fear, lust, anger, guilt, shame, emotional feelings. But there's spiritual feelings, all, say that back to me, all, all supernatural inner knowings are either seeing, hearing, or touching. And we've gotten so far from the touching that people are not even discerning the nature that's even on a prophetic word. But you know you're supposed to. You're supposed to discern the nature that's on a prophetic word. So there's a line of communication, but there's a line of authority. And you have to make the distinction that voice you hear in your head, if I'm going to bring it captive to the obedience of Christ, I want to know what's behind that, those words. I'm not going to take in and own everything I hear in my head. You say, well, it's in my head. It's got to be me. No. You can't necessarily stop a thought from entering your head, but you can eliminate the power behind it. Render it inoperative. Basically, you're killing it. You're bringing it to death. You're bringing the power to death, not the thought. I've seen too many people struggle trying to stop the thoughts when what you really need is to stop the power behind the thought. Now, first thing, the first thing is put the thought to the test. If you're a note taker, you need to write this down. Put the thought to a test first. If the thought has a negative upsetting emotion behind it, it can be an indication that if it's upsetting and negative behind it, it has emotional power over us. First, deal with the emotion, not the thought. First, deal with the power behind the thought. Ashley, these are the things you're going to be teaching other people in the days ahead. You're going to be teaching them how to get set free and how to do it with them and Jesus rather than going to a psychologist. How the answer is and always will be Jesus. And thank God for psychologists. There would be some people who wouldn't be with us today if it wasn't for them. But ultimately, the true answer is Jesus. Now, those thoughts have the two tracks. You're not going to silence the voice, but you're going to acknowledge that the anointing. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they're from God. Well, how do you do that? You just don't quote it. Test the spirit to see whether they're of God. What is the nature that's on the word that you're hearing in your head? What's the nature? Does it feel like the love of God? Does it have the fruit of the spirit attached? No. Secondly... Tested by the word. So first you got to test the thought as to the emotion, the nature behind it. Secondly, you need to test it by scripture. That's the easier one for most of you that are biblically literate. Is the thought scriptural? Because you're a new creation, the real you. I'm not talking about the part that needs evangelized yet. The real you loves God and loves His Word. So the real you doesn't talk like that. There's unredeemed parts of you that haven't heard the gospel yet, believe it or not. But uh, nevertheless, the real you loves God, loves His Word, doesn't talk like that. So if you hear something in your head <clears throat> that's not scriptural, what I taught Jennifer to do, and it worked, and she's taught other people. She taught one lady who was really in bad shape, and she taught her for one week. When you hear something demonically in your head, 
Like if I go to church, I'll destroy the whole church. If I go, she would hear all kinds of crazy stuff. She says, say, that's not me to yourself. And you know, she got set free. She learned to bring the thought captive to the obedience of Christ with a simple, that's not me. Now, when I say that's not me, yes, that was in her head. But the me we're talking about is a new creation reality joined together with the Lord. You're one spirit with Him. The real you loves God and loves His Word. The God that loves God and loves His Word, the you that loves God and loves His Word, that's not, not you talking. So when you say, that's not me, you literally, you literally separate out your true identity, and you're not prone to own the thought that's in your head. Hearing it and owning it are two different things. You don't want to own it. You can't stop from hearing goofy stuff in your head, but you don't have to own it. What they used to say, old-time preachers used to say, bird can fly over your head, you can't stop it, but don't let, if you make a nest, that's your fault. If he nests in your hair, that's your fault. All right, it's the same thing. You don't have to own it. Now, you test it. You put the thought to the test to see what's behind it. Secondly, you test it by Scripture, because all Scripture is given by inspiration, profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction. <coughs> then thirdly, you test it by the Spirit. You test it by the Spirit. <clears throat> Is that, can you feel anointing on it? You know, at some point you're going to have to get this word feeling and deal with it. There's a whole realm in practicing the presence of God when you're not talking, which you're aware of it. And I think it's a missing element in the church. We think the only time we can pray, we have to be talking. I don't agree with that. I believe that. <clears throat> Presencing a person, I am with him, and if I am aware, I'm touching him spirit to spirit. Uh, I know when Jennifer's in the car with me and we're driving, if no one's talking, I'm still having communion. Not communication, communion. Communion is spirit to spirit, heart to heart, breath to breath, awareness of that presence. Communication verbally only accentuates it and accelerates the relationship. It's necessary. It's an absolute necessity. But it's not the only thing in a relationship. Otherwise, I would just have Jennifer put me out on the porch and stay out on the porch and only come in the house when she wants to, has something to say. I don't think that'd be much of a relationship, do you? Mm -mm. Communion is to touch Practicing the presence of God like Brother Lawrence was not talking constantly. Practicing the presence of God was an awareness of his presence and a devotion that in every deed, every action, it was an action as unto him. In him, to him, through him. And God is basically saying, you need to understand by the spirit, the fruit. Test it also, not just by the Spirit, <clears throat> but test it by the fruit. If you get a thought that's troubling you in your head, think about, what if I followed through on that thought? What would it look like? That'd be a good way to test it by the fruit, wouldn't it? What would it look like if I did that? Like, Oh, Jesus, oh, Jesus, please help me with these kids. Oh, Jesus, please help me with these kids. And you lose enough sleep, and you think you're going to figure it out, and by the time you get up in the morning, you go, I'm just going to kill those kids. That's what I'm going to do. If you followed that through, you would say, that doesn't sound like God, does it? That was the voice of frustration. <clears throat> There's examples. <clears throat> There's simple distractions. Now, you can get a thought that fleets in and you're, you're driving a car and you're on the way to the grocery store and you get a thought come in. You can have thoughts that basically just go, oh, no, that was dumb, and let it go. When you let it go, you let it go from the heart. 
Okay? Those are like simple distractions. But then there's repetitive. Anybody ever have a repetitive thing that just nod at you? The same voice, the same repetitive. What we found is many people brought those thoughts captive when they went to prayer and said, God, where did that get started in my life? Because if there's fruit, there's a root. Where did I give place? You know, we're not to give place to the enemy. But if you've given place to something, you hear a repetitive thought that pops up every now and then in your life. Somewhere, if there's fruit, there's a root. You need to ask God, basically, most thoughts, you can basically bring them captive to the obedience of Christ. You take the thought captive just by, oh, that, that's not scriptural, that's not me, that's not the real me. The real me don't talk like that, I let it go. Or if you stayed on it a little too long, I receive forgiveness for even listening to that thought. Get cleansed. But a repetitive thought has a root. You need to learn how to... Here's some of the ones that some people hear over the years when we would minister to people, no matter where their Christian walk was at, no matter how mature they were, here's some of the ones they, they would hear often. I'm unworthy. Oh, boy. And you know, once, once you've owned that, it, it affects everything else you do. I'm unworthy. I can't do anything right. I never belong. I'm a failure. I have to have everybody's approval to feel good about myself. Good luck with that one. Good luck with all of them. None of those will bring lasting fruit. I have to have everybody's approval to feel good about myself. That's, that's a, that's a self-idolatry. That was one of my first revelations. I thought, oh, I get saved. I love God. I love people. That means everybody's going to love me. And then I found out that's not true. They're not all going to love you. But that's life. I love the Didache where it says, fast and pray for those enemies that don't like you. Hmm, because you know what? Then you end up with no enemies. When a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies be at peace with him. It changes your heart. And you begin to see, oh my goodness, that person that was my enemy, they need Jesus. They're the victim, not me. It's amazing. I'm a failure. Okay, let's carry that out. You need to find the root where that happened. And where did you give place to that if it's a repetitive? Because if you think about it logically, it's really stupid. God is in heaven, and he created mankind, and he said, mm, I'm going to make Dennis. Uh, yeah, let's see. His purpose will be to be a failure. Yeah, that's what I'm going to do. I've got to have some failures to mix in with the successful people. Right? So I think I'll just make you a failure. Okay? Fail, but don't be a failure. You know, wasn't it uh, Adam Smith? They said, you have a right to try and a right to fail. You have a right to try and you have a right to succeed. You know, you don't have to be a failure because you failed at something. Instead, get back up, learn from it. Hmm? Submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. So now if you're going to take a thought captive, here's another thing. If anyone is in Jesus, he is a new creature. Old things pass away, all things become new. Um, we taught people even how to make a distinction between inside and outside. This is a little harder now. This takes a quality relationship with God to where you're comfortable in His presence and you seek His presence and intimacy is a priority in your life. When intimacy is a priority in your life, you get accustomed to or acclimated to peace ruling. You have a tendency not to make decisions that aren't in peace. You have a tendency to hold back. If you lost your peace, you go, this is not a time for me to make any rash decisions. I'm going to wait until I get my peace back. All right. If you're used to living that way, you will then do, and I taught this to Jennifer, and it was, it was revolutionary for her. I says, inside, outside. The church don't talk much about inside, outside, because most people are too confused as it is uh, with spirituality. 
But I says, if you feel this intrusive, and you know it's demonic when it's really intrusive, you hear an intrusive, you get to see an intrusive manifestation and oppression come on you, instantly go to your spirit. If you have peace, where's that coming from? If you have peace, peace guards your heart and your mind. If you have peace, it's coming from the outside. If you have, you went, and you're terrified emotionally, you got to deal with that inside. Uh, Jennifer got her first healing when we were married from a tachycardia. It was a heart thing that her late husband was a medical doctor and said, it either stops or you die because there's really not much I can do. He gave her digitalis though, right? And we were married, she had, how often per month did you have that attack? Several times a month for 20 some years. We're lying in bed and I feel demonic fear in the room. Not in my spirit, but you know, oppression means it bears witness. So when I say I feel, what am I saying? I'm saying I'm at peace, but that peace is sensitive to what's going on, good or bad, in the atmosphere. And I feel fear. And I said, Jennifer, she goes, I'm having one of those, meaning those heart palpitations. And I says, what do you feel? And she went to herself first. Well, I've got peace. Or did you, or do we pray through fear? No, you're afraid inside. I said, first deal with the fear inside. I received forgiveness for taking in something Jesus didn't give me. And she got her peace. And without even commanding it to go, and I've seen this for 44 years now, so I don't argue with people on their deliverance methods, but I've seen it happen. Once the door is closed, in most cases, I didn't even have to command it to go. There's times you do, but it lifted because why? It had no place. There was nothing in her to attach to it. She got peace inside. The demonic left the room, and you could feel it leave. It was in the atmosphere. And she was physically healed, and it's been 23 years now. Totally healed. So there is a combination of knowing what's going on inside of you and what's oppressing. You really need to mature enough to know the difference. I mean, I used to go to intercessory prayer meetings and saw if there was a, a, a demonic manifestation of some sort. I saw intercessors run and leave the room. Ooh, yuck! <laughs> okay, greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. You don't have to run away from bad stuff. You need to address it. But when you address it, any word that comes out of your mouth needs to have authority and communication, not just... <gasps> Get out of here. <laughs> I doubt if there's any anointing on that. Go away in Jesus' name. All right. Can you see? Words have communication, but words have authority. You must deal with the authority, not just the content of the words. The devil can quote scripture. So basically what we're saying is, God's going to teach us how to pull down strongholds, but always start with the emotion. Jim Buchanan, when he, he, uh, he helped us edit our first book, Jim Buchanan says, um, I know most of the teaching that's out there. He said, the difference in yours over theirs is they start with the thoughts. He says, you start with the emotion. And I'm going, yeah, because... There's a power behind the thought. I want the power gone. Life and death, you've heard this. How many of you have been trained in faith camp? Life and death are in the power of the tongue. And I would say, explain that to me. And they would say, words. And I said, no, it's, that's a half-truth. The power of the words. Life and death are in the power behind those words. If you don't deal with the power behind the words... You're given the right answer with no authority. Now, you want to bring these thoughts captive? Then learn to practice peace. 
but also learn that everything that comes in your head that's not scriptural, what do you say? That's not me. And you'd be surprised how much victory you could walk in with that simple statement. And we've seen people that were in pretty bad mental shape after practicing that one week. That woman is now mentoring people in North Carolina. Scores and scores. She was a missionary's kid. But she heard that voice that if I go to Dennis and Jennifer's church, I will destroy it. I'm like, no, nah, I don't think so. And here's what I want you to do. All right. And I think her, her husband went to a different church, and she came only because he gave her permission, go get some help. And two weeks later, she said, I'm ready to go back with my husband. I said, that's a good idea. You've graduated. You go. But basically what she learned was how to lo locate the power behind the th crazy thoughts that were in her head and how to say that's not me, but also how to get your peace. Otherwise saying that's not me don't work if you're t terrified. If you're terrified, that's not me, that's not me. That's You've got to deal with the power behind it. All right? So how do we test it? Test the spirit. Mm -hmm. We test it <clears throat> to bring thoughts captive. We have to make a distinction. We have to test it by the word, test it by the spirit, test it by the fruit. Think about it. Test it by the fruit. If you hear something in your head and you say, Paul, it's got to be real. It's in my head. Well, look at the fruit. If you lived it out and it looks kind of dumb, you don't want it, do you? Say, that's not God. That's not me. When I hear a warning, I look for the redemption in the warning. And so then I'd say, okay, God, you're warning us about this or that. Then what is the redemptive revelation? What, what should I do to make ready a people prepared for the prophetic word? There's plenty of prophetic words out there that do not have a solution. They only tell you what's going to happen. I want to know what do I do to make ready a people prepared for what's going to happen. Don't you? Do you remember the first time we did that book signing years ago? The preacher, we were in another church and the preacher was saying, there's going to be a billion soul harvest and we got to be ready. Thus saith the Lord, a billion soul harvest. And we got to be, and we need to. And there was this long pregnant pause. <laughs> and we were doing a book signing and they said, I think maybe you ought to get Dennis and Jennifer's book. <laughs> because that is the place of the church. It's one thing to know what God is going to do. It's another thing is what am I supposed to do to make ready a people prepared? It's not all about you. It's about your functioning in the kingdom and advancing the kingdom. And for such a time as this, that's why I believe even in our, in our latest book, it's got the lost teaching of the apostles for such a time as this because it's going to be the same. If there was a huge harvest, you're going to get some people in there that you're just, your eyes are going to roll when they tell you what they believe. And you're going to have to start from scratch with all the love of heaven behind you. I believe everybody should have a Paul in their life. Everybody should have a Barnabas and everybody should have a Timothy. And I don't think the church is practicing that sufficiently. Go ye into all the world and make disciples. You should all have a Timothy somewhere. I don't care if it's your grandkids, but you need to have a Timothy. Who are you investing in? Who can call you and see, as a spiritual mom or dad? Who can call you to ask questions? Hmm? Because they need someone over them, but they need peer level relationship. Iron sharpens iron. But that doesn't eliminate having somebody over them that they, they feel trustworthy. The early church, the key word was mentoring. And you know it was one-on-one? -on -one? It wasn't until later on in the Didache where it expanded to group. How to behave in a congregation. How to, because first they were taught the foundation of what it looks like to be a Christian. The do's and the don'ts. So... If you've got spiritual hitchhikers even on some of the things that you've heard over the years in your head, you know, a spiritual hitchhiker is a demonic activity that wants to keep repeating it. I'm going to close with this though. I've seen this over and over again. When I see a repetitive pattern, it's based on an encounter 
and the subsequent relationship. And here's what I noticed. When I saw someone who was uh, fearful and dealing with an emotional issue, and God comes in and they repent, they receive forgiveness, and it changes to peace. Remember, you got two doors, emotion door, mind door. If there's a demonic hitchhiker and you get that door closed, I've seen this happen dozens of times. It goes instantly to the head and overplays its realm because it can't get in this door now because you just received forgiveness and got peace. It's because I'm not leaving. This isn't going to work. Do you, do you get the value of that statement? Most of the time it deceives you by speaking in first person. I'm stupid. I'm dumb. I'm a failure. I'm unworthy. But when you get deliverance, it goes, I'm not leaving. This isn't working. It just went and exposed itself even further that it's on its way out. It's gone. It's lost the victory. But what did it do? Once there was healing here, it went to the head. If the, uh, if the head goes, that's ridiculous. That's not scriptural. I'm not taking that. I renounce that lie. It'll go to the gut and go, whoosh, it's going to work. You feel that? Huh? You feel that? It's not working. It's a rat with a loudspeaker. And you have to basically realize that greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. You can't go by volume. Volume is not authority. Maybe. Otherwise, all preachers would scream if anointing was based on volume, right? We all delivered? Do you all know how to deliver? You know how to deal with your thoughts? All right. Are you going to train someone else in the days ahead? Most destructive relationships, it's in thinking that's not been dealt with, but the thinking can't be dealt with if you don't deal with the power behind the thought. I'm going to give you, I keep saying I'm going to close. I was going to close 15 minutes ago, but I'm closing. This is the second close. Here's a way to remember it. Mind, will, emotion. Think of it as an automobile. The mind is the steering wheel. Picture yourself sitting in a car. Your mind, the steering wheel, it goes, all, it goes all over the place, doesn't it? Doesn't your mind go all over the place? You gotta have a thought about here and a thought about there, all right? The motor, that's the emotion. The will is when you actually say, I'm doing it. <laughs> I'm gonna do it. I put it in drive. So the steering wheel is the thoughts. What I'm saying is, when you get crazy thoughts, don't put it in drive. Deal with the, shut the motor off. The toxic emotion is the motor, the power behind the vehicle, you. Does that help? Steering wheel is the mind. It's going all over the place. But you know what? If the motor's not on, it ain't going to hurt nothing because you dealt with the power, the motor. The emotions, the toxic emotions are the authority behind the thought, and if you don't act on it, impulse, it's not going to go anywhere. All right? So, Father, we just seal this work right now by the power of the Holy Spirit. We ask that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you train us all and equip us all to thoroughly, thoroughly bring every thought captive to the obedience of Jesus, to build a life structure, mind, will, and emotions that are thoroughly under the Lordship of the Holy Spirit thoroughly under him. Let the peace of God rule. Let the new creation, the real me, the real me rule. Spirit, soul, and body. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Don't forget to get your copy. Right? Amen. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, forgive123.com. 
For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit forgive123.com.